You've been with me all along, all along, always on my side. You've never gone. You've been with me all along, and you've been holding on, holding on for so long. Whenever this would be gone, you stayed with me all along. You've been with me when I laugh or cry. Anywhere I stood, you were standing by. With me when I'm fine, with me when I'm not. With me when I'm giving everything I got. With me all along, not a cameo. Every scene, every episode, in every video. Skip no scenario, back anywhere we go. You've been with me all along, all along. our seniors this is a, an exciting time for them and their families happy time a sad time as well and we're going to talk a lot about that today during uh, the service with these three we can't start laughing that's one of the things we said we cannot get tickled up here and start laughing because we may not get it back together um, just a reminder that our vision at Highland is to build up the next generation and so that's part of this. HYG is a huge part of that. We've been doing that for a long time, along with our children and young adults. And so we are um, looking for people to be disciple makers. Because one of the things we want to do is provide discipleship for young adults. And so we need adults that are a little older to disciple our people who are, you know, 17 or 18, up to 25 or 26. And so we're going to use this book. It's called the Real Life Theology Handbook. And we really like this resource. Uh, it's got good answers, uh, points people to God, it uh, has answers to the big questions, so that if you're a young adult, you know the answers and you can learn those and you can apply them to your life. And so our, our youth ministers are always saying, apparently, Jesus has the best answers to the big questions. Have you ever heard them say that? They say it all the time. Today may have been the first time they said it, but anyway, uh, we want every young person to not only uh, know those answers, but to build their life on those answers. We think that just building your life on Christ is the main thing. And so today we're going to talk with our youth ministers who, by the way, they're all three first-round draft picks. They're superstars in youth ministry. They do a great job, and we're thankful, and I'm just grateful that we have them leading our students. So it's a good thing. So we're going to talk with them. And so to do that, we're just going to use three words. We're going to keep it simple today. We're just going to use three of the biggest words theological words that there are gospel grace and faith and so we want to help every person in this next generation do know these things know the gospel experience grace and have faith so ted we'll start with you what is the gospel and why does it matter yeah so we inspire for our students to share the good news and we inspire for our students to know the gospel that good news, as we know, has remained the same for over 2,000 years. And that news that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. And because of that, he is our king. It's our prayer that the gospel is an essential part of our students' everyday life. 
and uh, that they believe in the good news and they're sharing the good news with their friends. Why is that? Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The short sentence presents the very reason why the gospel is so important. Paul's message is that no matter who you are, the gospel message is for you. Then he takes it a step further in verse 24, and he says, Even though we all have sinned, we are justified freely by his grace to the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. These strong words in both of these texts lays out clearly that the gospel message isn't a message uh, that's built for favoritism or a message that's built for popularity, but it's a message that gives hope to everything that breathes that Jesus is king and our king redeems us. He shows us his love and he proves that he desires the best for each and every one of us. One of the things I joke about in my uh, short 25-year lifespan is the back-in-my-day statements. And some of you are probably sitting there and saying, I have socks older than you. But I, I joke about these things like going to school uphill both ways or how advanced technology is and it wasn't as advanced when I was a teenager. I'm not too far removed from a teenager. But I joke about these things of, oh, I'm so old and things were different back in my day. But I think all of us can agree that being a teenager right now is harder than it has ever been. There's so many voices speaking into our young people, trying to push them outside the church and trying to push them in to many different places. And we want our students to know that those voices, at the end of the day, those voices will fail. But the only voice that will remain true and has continued to remain true, and that is the voice of Jesus Christ, which is the gospel. And it's our prayer that, this, that our students know that that gospel is the voice that speaks louder than any other voice in the room, that the message of Jesus speaks louder than any other message in the room. When we talk about good news, it's something that you want to share. When you have good news, you can't help but to keep it to yourself. If, you're, if your kids are having or announcing their pregnancy or you got a promotion at your job or something good is happening in your life, you can't just keep it to yourself. And when we talk about the gospel, it is good news and it is something that we should share. And I believe that is what our students are doing when you talk about good news. I want to tell you a story about something that has happened in HYG in the last year. One of our students invited somebody to come to church last summer and uh, they invited them and that student just fell in love because first they believed that the, the good news that the student invited them was sharing and they believed that, well, if he believes this, then it must be something really powerful. And so that student started coming to church and they started coming to all of our events. They, they signed up for camp. They came to Winterfest, and that student just got plugged in, and within less than a year. And so in a couple of weeks, it'll be a year of that student coming to Highland. But the cool part about that story is that student believed the good news that the person who invited them was sharing, that that very same student that came just less than a year ago was baptized in this baptistry less than two months ago. And that's the power that the gospel holds, and that's the power that, that, that Jesus carries, that it's not anything that we are doing, it's the power of the gospel message working through us, and it's the power of the gospel message working through our students. Well, thanks, Grandpa Ted. All right. Um, we do want our, our next generation to know the gospel. We also want them to experience God's grace. So Hannah, talk, let's talk about uh, grace and, and how do we um, keep that going. Yeah, so our hope for all students in HYG is that they come to accept this good news, right, the gospel, and experience the transformative gifts that come along with that, one of the biggest one being God's grace. Uh, one of my first summers here at Highland, I was at Camp Highland. It was Thursday night, and if you know anything about Thursday night at Camp Highland, emotions are high, and it's mostly because everyone is exhausted, okay? And so, but this Thursday night, I met with a student um, who was just completely overwhelmed by the weight of the brokenness in his life. He had come to accept the good news in baptism and accept that, but he still couldn't get over this, this brokenness and this weight in his life. Um, but he was having the hardest time understanding how God could still love him. In this particular moment, he was unable to understand God's grace for him. 
I think grace is a word we throw around a lot in church, but we're not exactly sure what it means and how it changes our, our own personal lives. I think God's grace can be helpful to think of in two ways. Grace is saving kindness God shows us, and grace is ex- transforming gifts that he gives us. Which by saying that, grace in its very nature is an experience. You know, Jesus in his ministry never actually uses the term grace. But I feel like it's easy for us to flip through the Bible and see all the ways that we've learned about grace through his life. Like when he touches the man with leprosy before he heals him. Or when he protects the woman caught in adultery from being stoned. Or when he lifts Peter out of the water despite his lack of faith. Saving kindness and transforming gifts. Stories like these are where we know that grace uh, defined the life of Jesus. And now, because of the Holy Spirit, we get to experience that same grace. You know, grace interacts with us, I think, in so many ways. Um, But I think of times like when one of our youth volunteers, Mary Jackson, I got to baptize four students this spring. God's grace was never meant to just stay, flow into us and stay put with us. But instead, God's grace motivates us to share it with others. By God's grace, Mary was an active agent in sharing the gospel. This really makes absolutely no sense if you actually think about it, uh, that God would use the very people that Jesus came down to save who need his grace to also be the people that are agents for sharing the good news of his grace. This is exactly what grace does, though, and it's something that we desire for our students to recognize that they get to participate in. Also think about how I've watched multiple students this spring realize that God's grace was literally chasing after them so that it would change their identity. We got to be witnesses to over a dozen students give their life to Christ this spring. We want students to know that God's grace in some sense is pursuing them and it can transform their identity. You know, Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 1. You know, he was a persecutor of the church, realizing his unworthiness to be an apostle, but recognizing that by the power of God's grace, he is what he is, which is, a, you know, a persecutor of the church transformed um, to be one of the early definers of the early church. Our hope for students is that they know that God's grace is what defines them. No matter what has happened in their lives, God's grace can and will transform their identity. You know, if I could go back in time and tell that student on that Thursday night of camp one thing, I would without a doubt tell him more about grace. I would tell him more about how God's grace is always before us. And that in Hebrews 4, we get to to read about this beautiful image about how we get to step in front of God's throne of grace with confidence, knowing that we will receive mercy and grace in our time of need. And because of that promise, uh, we don't need to doubt or worry about God's love for us because there's literally nothing within our power that will change how he feels about us and the grace that he supplies us. And that when we feel weak, that is exactly where the power of, of who God is that supplies that grace is made perfect. We want our students to know that no matter what happens in their journey of faith, they can remain confident in the fact that the grace that is given to them, that is chasing after them, and that is transforming them. And because of that incredible truth, our only response is to pursue holiness and faithfulness to him as our king. All right. Thanks, Anna. You do a great job of showing grace to students and walking in grace with students and helping them experience. And so I appreciate the way you are living that out yourselves. Uh, Donnie, we hope that this grace and the gospel produces faith, so you want to talk about faith a little bit? You should be really impressed that at least two out of the three of your youth ministers can take the biggest concepts in Scripture and make sense out of them in less than five minutes. I mean, that's better than the shooting percentage of the Grizzlies in the playoffs. So, uh, <laughs> But doesn't the gospel and grace sound too good to be true? Like... It is too good, and um, I desperately need it to be true, but is it really? And how can can I believe in that? How can our students believe in that? Uh, And I think that's why this third thing that we want for you and for the next generation is so important, because we want our students to have a faith that lasts. And it sounds pretty simple, huh? Especially when you think about faith as as believing that God is who he says he is and that he's going to do what he promised he's going to do. That's pretty simple. Uh, but and, and think about it in terms of the gospel and grace. It's believing that the gospel is true 
and it's believing that grace actually works. Uh, and, and not just for a moment, and not just for a season, but all the time. And that reminds me of uh, a senior Sunday from a few years ago. Uh, our, our, you know, our seniors, when they graduate, they get all sorts of advice, and most of it's forgotten. But one of our shepherds on that Sunday shared something that has stuck with me. Uh, and he challenged our seniors that Sunday. He said, we don't want Senior Sunday to be the pinnacle of your faith. And, th and that elder was challenging our seniors to have a faith that lasts, that doesn't just exist in high school, but that continues on throughout their life, uh, that it's more than just a moment, that it keeps growing. And I think that's the rub for all of us. Uh, we don't want Thursday night at camp to be the only time our students feel close to God all year. And we don't want... Sunday morning to be the only time that you think about your relationship with God during the week. Uh, we, we all want to have a faith that's great and that lasts beyond just a moment. And I think it's why Hebrews 11 uh, is such an important chapter in the Bible, and I'm drawn to it uh, because I read these stories about these ordinary people who have this great faith, and, and I want faith like that. But I ask myself, like, do I have what they have? Can I do those things? Uh, and, and ultimately, it makes me wonder, like, What's the key? Like, why were they able to have such great faith? And I think the writer in Hebrews 12 uh, gives us the key. He says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And I could highlight a bunch of things that, that could be the key. Like you could focus on the cloud of witnesses and how encouraging that is and how that gives you a sense of I'm not alone. Or you could talk about running the race part and how that evokes this idea of determination and discipline and this, this thought of I can do it. Um, or sin, like we know what it's like to be caught up in sin and how easily that can make us forget that there's even a race or make us say things, think that it just completely disqualifies us from the race and say things to ourselves like I'm not enough and so, well, I might as well give up. And all those things are, are key elements to faith and could be a sermon in its own standing. Uh, but all of those things focus on the wrong thing because all of those things focus on me, Right? The writer in Hebrews says uh, to have faith um, is to focus on Jesus and his faithfulness. Because faith is not about your own strength or your own goodness. It's about God's faithfulness and the fact that he stuck it out. He never gives up. He always comes through. And we're able to have great faith because God is faithful to us. One of my favorite songs is uh, 10,000 Reasons, and it's, it's given a lot of meaning to our family through the years. Uh, and in the second verse of that song, it says this, you're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness, I will keep on singing 10,000 reasons for my heart to find. And every time I sing that song, I have greater faith because I'm reminded I have this list of reasons and all this evidence of God's faithfulness in my own life. And it gives me faith. It gives me hope. It encourages me because God has always had my back and he's for me and he's never let me down. And I think uh, that's our hope for our students and for you. Uh, that at Highland, through worship and relationships that you have, through Camp Highland and huddles and all the things we experience here as a, as a church family, that you have this growing list of reasons and evidence of God's faithfulness in your life. And because of that, it gives you greater faith. And I heard this happening uh, a few months ago. I got to uh, eat dinner with several of our students that are freshmen at University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And that was a big sacrifice for me to go into the city limits of Knoxville and, and share a meal. And it happened to be the night after Tennessee had beaten Alabama in basketball. And, uh, and we have these conversations and we start talking about memories from Highland and things that happened in the youth group. And, and then the next thing I know, we're having conversations about what God's doing in their life right now and how, God's growing, how they're growing in their faith and, and how they're encouraging each other and, and loving others. And, and here's the beautiful thing about that. 
those memories that they have here at Highland were giving them faith right now. A faith that keeps going. A faith that lasts. And that's what we want, not just for them, but for everyone. Yeah, that's awesome, Donnie. So thank you all for sharing because, uh, you know, HYG or the Highland Youth Group, uh, they are partnering with parents to help all these students from 6th through 12th grade know the gospel and experience grace and have faith. So they're giving them experiences and they're teaching lessons on it and then they're modeling, modeling it along with a lot of volunteers that are making that happen. And we do want that. We want that for our students right now. But most of all, we want it for them when they're 30 years old. We want it for them when they're 50 years old or 80 years old. We want them to still know the gospel and still experience God's grace every day and still have faith. So that's the key. It's a, it's a long game. And parents are the number one influence. And so we're partnering with them. We're doing the best we can as a church and as ministers to do that and these three do a great job with that. So I'm very thankful for you guys, and our church is thankful for you. Thankful for our seniors. And today we're gonna, we are going to honor them in just a minute. Just want to remind you, if you want to be a part of uh, helping build up the next generation, that class is Wednesday night at 630. It's going to meet in D100, which is the, I think it's the Family of Faith classroom. Thank you for being here today. Have a great rest of the day and a great week serving the Lord.